to election mon majority and minority influences the first lecture in the series on our second our course on social influence and um, we moving on we're developing from the the previous bit of work that we've done on social identity theory and this slide over here acts as a bridge between social identity theory and where we are now You'll remember that social identity theory is really a theory of influence, a theory of social influence that's rooted in an understanding of group belongingness. It's, it's got a view of society not as a collection of individuals, but as individuals arranged within groups. And the, the psychological, the central psychological dynamic there is that of categorization. That individuals, that people categorize, just as we can categorize oranges and apples and fruit, we can categorize people. And the interesting thing about that is that we put ourselves, individuals within a group, self-categorization. And this has profound uh, social psychological consequences. One of the consequences of categorization is an accentuation effect where we accentuate the differences between groups. We make them look bigger than they really are and minimize the differences within groups. A second uh, feature of social identity theory is this notion of social status, that societies are organized hierarchically. Certain groups have more power in society than others. And of course, we all seek to belong to high status groups. The, the third dynamic that I've got down there is social comparison. This is where the, the, the psychological significance of the social status hierarchy becomes uh, felt uh, personally. When we compare the status and relative worth of our group to others in society, and if our group is on top, we uh, feel good. We, uh, social identity theory argues that your self-esteem benefits to that. And so we've got groups in society that are competing with each other for, for social status and the subjective sense of worth and value that comes from, from that. Um, social identity theory calls this uh, positive distinctiveness, the quest to, to be different from others, uh, positively better off, so positive distinctiveness. You'll notice here that in, in my slide that these social psychological dynamics lead to behavioral impacts and attitudinal impacts on individuals. And this over here is essentially the crux of what social influence is. When we're part of a group, we start acquiring perceptions of the group, the behavior of the group, the attitudes of the group. It's most clearly demonstrated in, in crowd behavior where you've got a collection of individuals that come together, they start behaving similarly, thinking similarly, emotions flow through those crowd, through that crowd. And of course, as it starts happening, you see there's a, there's a, a dialectic there, there's a dynamic process. The more and more uh, our behaviors become more distinct, the more we categorize each, uh, ourselves into different groups. And so these processes are, are self-reinforcing -re and perpetuating. Now, one of the effects of this dynamic is the emergence of social norms in society. Take, for example, tennis. There's no rule in tennis that says after the game you need to shake hands. This is uh, a behavior that tennis players have acquired. It's emerged as a social norm. Part of what it is to be a tennis player is to, to shake your hands afterwards it's it's a norm if you played a game of tennis and you didn't shake the hands afterwards you would be ostracized or rejected or or viewed as rude etc and so we see that um this group dynamic can produce behavioral effects on individuals in society and of course this is widespread here for example is uh, a group of students some students uh, have drinking clubs and a uh, drink of alcoholic beverages is part of the identity, it's part of the entertainment. Um, other groups of students perhaps are, are, are soccer players or, or do other kinds of things. Um, and so the student body itself is, is broken up into these various groupings of individuals, each with their own norms, each defining themselves vis-a-vis -vis other groups. There's an in-group, out-group -group dynamic. There's a, this quest for positive distinctiveness. Groups like to think they they better, their values are better, they more fun-loving than others, for example. And of course, as we've described, self-esteem is built into this. And of course, these, the, the drinking behavior becomes a behavioral marker. 
it's a mark of belonging to this group. And if you if you wanted to be part of that group, you would need to to join them in in what they enjoy doing. So our focus of this lecture is on conformity. Conformity is lies at the heart of the theories of social influence, and it's essentially um, accounts of how other individuals around can, can affect you as a target individual, how the majority or others affect individuals. And according to the, the definitions of there, the presence of others and others in a group can have profound effect on our attitudes and our behaviors and, in fact, uh, on our lives. So peer pressure is a very good example. It's a colloquial way of, of talking about uh, conformity influences. Uh, young people, for example, might take up smoking or drinking behavior because of the influence of, of their peers and, and other kinds of risky behaviors and other good behaviors, in fact. So I want to introduce you now a, a very famous social psychology experiment that demonstrated the influence of conformity pressure. Now, the experiment used a, a set of lines like this. Now, which of the, the three lines A, B, C is the same length as the, the standard line on the, on the other side? And the answer is quite obvious. It's C, isn't it? Uh, a, B, a is much shorter, B is much bigger, and it's, it's clear. It's an obvious answer. Now, in this experiment, Solomon Ash produced a situation in which people gave the wrong answer. For example, they said A is the, is the matching line. <clears throat> so um, there's a picture of Solomon Ash. Um, he has the experimental setup. Imagine you, the experimental subject, you come into the experiment and you seat it over here, second from the end. All the rest of the subjects in the, in the room are actually not um, experimental subjects. They're confederates. They've been placed there by the experimenter and they know what to do. They've got pre-programmed behavior, but you over here don't know that. And so the experimenter starts here by showing the lines, those, uh, those lines and the matching line, and they ask the first individual, which is the matching line, and gives the correct answer, and goes on to the second one, correct answer, third, correct, 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 you give the correct answer, it goes around. Uh, the second lot of lines come on, um, Solomon Ash had a, had a collection of 18 lines, 12 lines, everyone gave the correct answer, and there were six lines which were critical trials where people gave the, the incorrect answer. So when you have a couple of rounds with everyone giving the correct answer, now the, on the fourth round, yeah, the, the first individual gives the incorrect answer. The second individual gives the incorrect answer. Incorrect, incorrect, incorrect. Now comes to you. What do you do? Do you give the correct answer or do you give the incorrect answer? Well, the results of... Um, Ash's study showed that 37 of the 50 subjects who participated in the study conformed and gave the obviously incorrect answer at least once. 14 conformed of, on all six of those critical trials, those staged trials, and on average subjects conformed on four of the six stage trials. So there was this high levels of conformity where people gave the wrong answer even though they knew it was the wrong answer. The question is why? So Solomon Ash developed a, a dual process model or theory of social influence where he argued that the two underlying forces or two underlying dynamics that produce this uh, conformity behavior. The first dynamic he called informational influence, the influence to accept information from another as valid evidence about reality. And we do this all the time. If you take a look at your own behavior on social media, Facebook, for example, we start uh, uh, liking and sharing attitudes of those of our, of our friends. Individuals need to be correct, to uh, hold views that they, that they believe have value. And how do you, um, have, where do you acquire these views, for example? It's very often not from the study of reality itself. For example, political views. Who's read the constitution of the political party they support? Most often, it's through this process of comparing what do my friends believe, or, you know, what are they doing, what are they supporting, that we start acquiring views about what is good and what is true and what is real. And so that first dynamic is an informational influence dynamic that we look to others 
to get a view of the, 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 the world that we should adopt, the kinds of attitudes, the kinds of beliefs that we should have. The second influence that Ash spoke about was normative influence. Now, this here is the pressure that others can place on you to conform. We, no one wants to stick out. No one wants to stick out as a sore, as a sore thumb, as it were, that um, holds views different to everyone else. There's a risk of rejection from the group, social disapproval. And so Solomon Ash called this normative pressure. The individuals need to seek social approval by conforming to what the group does. Now, in social psychology, we often conduct replications of experiments where we manipulate certain features of the experimental situation to try and get a deeper understanding of the processes and dynamics that, um, that cause the behavior that we want to study. And this is what Deutsch and Gerard did in a, in a famous old experiment. They basically took the Solomon Ash scenario where they had those lines and there were staged incorrect answers that Confederates gave. But here they created a few variations. In the first situation, they had groups competing with each other and only the group that made the least errors, the winning group would receive tickets for Broadway. And so groups were competing to make as few errors as possible so that they could win these tickets. The second condition of there is the standard Solomon Ash condition. That's where you gave your answers in the presence of others. And then he manipulated two other conditions. One there is the presence of the stimulus. Either the stimulus was present while you're making your decision, you could see the lines and the incorrect answer before your eyes, or else the experimenter, when the stimulus was absent, showed the lines, took it away, and then asked people to give their responses. The final condition there is private commitment. You didn't have to say out loud what your answer was. You could simply write it on a little piece of paper, make a private response. And you can see what Deutsch and Gerard are doing here. They're manipulating the effect of normative and informational influences in these different conditions. Now, take a look at the results here. You, you notice first, compare the group goal to the face-to-face -face goal. Now, the face-to-face -face goal is your, your, your standard Solomon Ash condition. In the group goal, they made few errors. No, they made more errors. The groups are competing to make as few errors as possible to win the Broadway tickets. And what did they do? They ended up making more errors. Why? Well, there must have been stronger pressure for conformity within those groups. Even if you knew the error was wrong, you didn't want to stand out as the one that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that was different in that situation. So competition produced more conformity. The stronger the group pressures, the more the conformity and the greater the level of error. Of course, there in the anonymous and the private commitment condition, where there is very little normative influence because you, 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 you're giving anonymous responses or you're just writing them down uh, on a piece of paper to yourself, there's very low levels of, of error there, so low levels of conformity. So those conditions really show and they provide support for the idea that there's normative influences and normative pressure in this uh, experimental situation. But take a look at the two columns now, the stimulus present and the stimulus absent. And you'll notice that there's higher levels of error when the stimulus is, is absent. And this, um, Deutsch and Gerald argued, showed the, 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 the effect of informational influence. When the stimulus is absent, your, your answer is less rooted from what you can see before your eyes and much more um, affected by the, the ideas of, of your peers. And so the study overall is a great success in showing that these two dynamics of informational influence and normative influence that Solomon Ash had proposed uh, indeed were present in that experimental situation. So what does the Solomon Ash study show us? What does the study on conformity show us? Well, it shows us that majorities have a powerful effect on minorities, that other group members powerfully shape the way us as individuals behave. But take a look at this graph, which shows the, on the, on the x-axis over there, as the, the size of the majority grows, as it grows past 7 to 9, 10, 11, up to 15, the errors increase 
very sharply as the majority increases up to seven. And after that, the power of majority influences uh, decreases. And this over here shows you that just having a bigger and bigger group doesn't create more and more power. The optimal size for group power and for conformity dynamics is around about seven from, from, um, from this data. But it, 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 it leads us to raise questions about why. How come just having more and more of a majority, a bigger and bigger majorities, doesn't increase the pressure? And it, it raises questions about resistance, the possibility of individuals now not wanting to, to follow the majority, and even the possibility of minorities having power over majorities. And so uh, in, in the wake of these results and, and other work within sociology and social psychology, um, a lot of theorists have looked towards the power of minorities. Can minorities influence you just as much as majorities do? Yes, from sociologists, the definition of what is a minority, you know, we're going back to this idea that societies, there's a hierarchy of groups in society with uh, powerful groups on top and minority groups on the bottom. And so Yinger, Simpson and Yinger define minorities as subordinate elements in complex state societies. Uh, very often they have uh, special physical, cultural traits. They might be uh, foreigners. They might be uh, groups that are small voiceless groups, vegetarians, vegans, for example, um, groups that are often held in, in low esteem by the majority. And if you look at definition number three, it links us very nicely into social identity theory because minorities are self-conscious groups. You remember social identity theory's definition of what a group is. A group is a, a, a individuals who define themselves as a member of that group. So minorities are, 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 are groupings that define themselves as those that are, are stigmatized or disadvantaged in society. And so uh, Serge Moscovici, a French social psychologist, famous one, he decided to uh, replicate the Solomon Ash study. But in his study, he had a minority of two and a majority of four. And now he wanted to ask, is it possible that the minority could influence the beliefs and opinions of the majority? So his, his experimental setup, he had 32 color slides and much like the Solomon Ash study, he showed a slide and asked them like, which is, what color is that slide? Is that yellow? Is that orange? Is that red? And on the slides that were blue, he asked the Confederates to say they were green. So you had two, a minority of two Confederates consistently saying the, the green slides are blue and they gave the correct answers to, to all the others. And he wanted to say, well, can this minority affect the majority? And his results showed, yes, there, is a, there certainly is um, evidence for minorities affecting majorities. It was absolutely vital that the minorities were consistent. Every time the green slide came, uh, sorry, every time the blue slide came, they said green. Both of them uh, said it together. If the minority was inconsistent and one said and the other didn't, and sometimes it was blue, sometimes it was green, the, the, the um, effect of minority influence uh, de declined. So it raises an interesting question in the study. What could account for the power of minorities? Minorities can't make majorities stick out like a sore thumb. Most of the majority have different views from them. So what could account for those information and normative processes that Solomon Ash was interested in don't really apply here in the situation of minority influence. So what Moscovici argues is that minorities, if they're consistent and yet flexible, they project a behavioral style of confidence that they really know what's going on. Um, their uh, minority views are quite distinctive. They, 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 they strike the majority as unusual. And when they hold them consistently, they project a behavioral style. They can produce genuine change of view amongst the, the majority. This is Moscovici's argue. Look how he defines behavioral style there on the slide. The organizational responses uh, according to a particular pattern with recognizable meaning. It projects an internal state, a state of confidence, a state of knowing what uh, uh, is true and what is right into reality. And this can persuade um, the majorities. And if you take a look 
at um, uh, minority voices in society. And there's been many of them that have come from minorities into uh, being a majority. They are often have these kinds of traits. Take, for example, in, in South Africa, the political leader, Julius Malema, a, a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, he was a lone voice um, in opposition to, to just about everyone else. And he was uh, fought for the, um, the redistribution of land in South Africa. And he, he, he went to court for it. He was consistent over time in plugging away at a social justice agenda. And um, he's been enormously influential in creating a, a new political party and in influencing even the, the, the ruling party to change its policy. So here you see a lone voice, a minority, can have a powerful influence on a majority if it projects a behavioral style of confidence yet flexibility into the social environment. And so in this uh, lecture we've looked at two uh, of the fundamental processes associated with social influence, the influence of majorities on minorities and the influence that minorities can have on majorities. Thank you very much.